This is uh, Brian Harris with the Independent Black Voters Speak and Black Book Media as we continue our series of Know Your Candidates. On April 9th will be the election. However, your ballots will go out approximately May 1st. This is a new election and the fact that the majority of voting will be done through the mail. And we encourage that everyone know their candidates. Today, we continue our series of Know Your Candidates. We have, uh, we have, we have attorney slash judge uh, William Gonzalez, is that correct? That's correct, I go by Bill Gonzalez. And Brian, I just wanna note, I think you said April 9th, but the primary is on June 9th. Okay, I'm sorry, the primary is June 9th. The, uh, the, the mailers are gonna go out on May 1st. So they're actually going to mail out the, uh, the, the, the ballots on May 1st for this, uh, for the uh, election. So, so let's go forward now. And uh, again, Bill, give us, a, tell us a little bit about you. Tell us a little bit about the department. Uh, tell us your values and beliefs and tell us a little bit of why we, the um, black community should consider you as one of the candidates. Very good, Brian. Well, first of all, I'd like to thank you all for this opportunity. Uh, it's very difficult for us candidates to get people to really know us, and there's very few opportunities. And this year, there's even less opportunities. So I appreciate you reaching out to me and giving me this opportunity. Um, why I think you should vote for me has a lot to do with my experience uh, as an attorney and as a judge. But I think the, the bigger reasons why people should vote for me is the person that I am. I grew up in Southern California. Uh, I worked for General Telephone. I was a member of the uh, Communication Workers of America. Yeah, yeah I had a call come in uh, that I had to get rid of. Um, so I put myself through uh, college, um, working full-time in the day, uh, going to school at night. Uh, I have a bachelor's degree in business. I have a master's in international management, and I have uh, my law degree. Uh, I've been a practicing attorney here for about 23 years. The vast majority of my time as an attorney has been people, helping people of you know, lower income, uh, people that do not have a voice in the community. I was a public defender for about 10 years. The last five years, I was representing uh, juveniles in the juvenile justice system, probably represented about 2,000 children. Uh, most of the children there were black and brown. As you all know, there's a, a, a big disparity in our court systems uh, regarding minorities. Um, I served as the vice chair for the City of Las Vegas Housing Authority. I was appointed by uh, Oscar Goodman, who was our then mayor. I, I did that for four years, fighting for housing, for our low income, for our seniors, for our veterans. We'd go back to Washington, D.C. and lobby on behalf of our community. Uh, I enjoyed doing that. In 2009, I was vetted by, there was an opening in my seat, it was Department F. And I went through a judicial selection process where they vetted your experience in the courtroom, your experience in the community, your experience as to other people who uh, were applying. I was one of the top three candidates. I went in front of the governor and I was appointed to Family Court Department F in 2009. I served there for about six years. Uh, I loved that, I enjoyed it. Um, in my department, my first law clerk, uh, Kelly Jones, was African-American. Uh, she, she was with me for two years. She graduated from the um, UNLV. I had my marshal, my last marshal was African-American. There was great diversity in my department. I also served on the clinical boards for the UNLV Law School. That was something very important. And I've mentored numerous um, you know, students at the high school level, college level, and also at the uh, law school level. For me, you know, I feel very blessed. I've been given a lot of opportunities in life, and I feel it's important to give back to the community and help others have an opportunity to, you know, get an education, to have a profession where they can provide for their family and 
those are some of the things that I have done. Um, if you have any specific questions that you'd like to ask me regarding my background, I would say I've been married uh, 33 years to my wonderful wife. We have four children, ages 31, 29, uh, 23, and 19. We have two grandbabies. And, you know, my goal in the community is to make sure from the bench that everybody is treated with respect, with dignity. And my goal is to get people out of family court as quickly as possible. And I'm really good at that because the emotional stress, the financial stress of being in court for a lot of people that don't have even the funds to be there, you know, that it's very important that they're able to have their voice heard and have a fair hearing and be able to resolve it and, and move on with life. Okay. Uh, so tell me right now, uh, again, one of the reasons that uh, we, the independent black voters, have uh, looked to vet all the candidates is we believe there's a lot of room for improvement. When you look at the judicial system right now, they talk about it being colorblind, but it is not. They talk about it uh, being uh, uh, an easy uh, scales, uh, balanced scales of justice, but we do not believe it is not. In our community, we want to know from the candidates that are running, what are your thoughts of the existing um, state of affairs in the judicial system and how you would work to improve or make it better so there is definitely equal justice uh, under the law? Well, as far as what you've just mentioned, Brian, you know, the, the facts clearly support your statement. There is a great disparity. Uh, and it needs to be addressed, and it has not been addressed um, as much as it should. And when I was a public defender, I saw that every day when you have somebody do, who did not have the ability to to, to pay bail, even on a on, on a crime that was you know a, a non-violent crime, and they were sitting up in jail because they couldn't post a bond or their family couldn't you know put their their house up for you know a, as collateral. And so that's something when you go into court. Again, that's part of my past, not, not currently as a family court would I be doing that, but those are issues that have to be addressed and it has to be, you know, based on factors that are non-financial. And if you have somebody who's not a risk to the community, who um, doesn't have the funds, but is not a flight risk, is not a risk for violence, then you should give that person an OR release and that person should be able to fight for their case outside because it's much more difficult trying to fight when you're inside locked up in jail. Um, in the courtroom, you see that a lot. There's a lot of people who come into the courtroom that can't afford an attorney in family court. You need to make sure that their voice is heard, that they're given an opportunity. Uh, there's a lot of programs that we can refer people to through Legal Aid of Southern Nevada. Uh, there's other attorneys that provide, you know, the basics of presenting evidence in the courtroom, of, of getting your your witnesses to testify because if, unfortunately if you don't follow the the rules of evidence and you don't provide a witness list and you don't provide a list of your documents that you want the court to see then legally the court can't hear that and so as a judge that's something that I always made sure that people knew well ahead of time before trial or before an evidentiary hearing what it is that it would be helpful for me to make a decision and how is it they can get that information before me and and that's something that you see again, you know, at the at the lower ends, you know, there's a lot of you know black people, brown people, a lot of minorities that can't afford an attorney. And that, as a judge, you got to make sure as much as possible that it's it's a balanced, you know, playing field when they walk into the courtroom. Absolutely, because like I said today, it is that is not the case. Um, let me uh, find out, and folks, I want to introduce Bria. Bria Warbo is uh, our is our youth and our uh, millennial associate. She's working with us to make sure that we have informed millennials that they get out and vote and they vote with uh, as educated voters. Bria, say hello. Hi, how you doing? Okay. Hi, Bria. Nice to hear from you today. Yeah, it was, it's nice to hear from you as well. I'm very glad to be on this call. Um, I feel like you've given some really great pointers and information without us even having to ask you the questions about it. It seems like you're very aware of what's going on and you're also doing things to um, help with it. 
So I, I love what I hear so far. I'd love to know more about you and exactly what, um, what type of judge you are. I know you're a family court judge, but exactly like what, um, what you will be doing. Okay, that, that's a great question. What do you um, handle and stuff like that? Okay, so that, that is a, a great question. So I was on the family court bench from 2009 to 2015, and my caseload back then was custody issues, divorce issues, adoptions, um, issues of child support relating to that. Uh, currently, I'm a court-appointed counsel in abuse and neglect, and so I represent parents when their children are taken out out of the home they have a right to have a hearing within 72 hours before a district court judge to make sure that there was a legal basis for the removal of the children and that the foster care system department of family services they did everything that they could do to keep the children in that home and to try to work on a, a safety plan and so right now the vast majority of my um my clients that I represent. A lot of them have substance abuse issues, mental health issues, there's domestic violence in, um, in, the, in play. Uh, but they're, if they don't have family, their kids go into foster care. Um, and, and I fight every day to try to get you know, the kids back into the home, back with their parents because they're traumatizing. Right now, there are three brand new seats created by the legislature, or actually there's six. But three of those are going to be designated as judges that handle the abuse and neglect where the kids are in the foster care. That's what I would like to do. I've been doing that, you know, primarily for the last four years. And, and I love doing that. And out of those three seats, if I'm back on the bench, then that's where I would like to go because I love helping people out at that level. Okay, great. And now uh, also Jason Swan. Jason is part of our team, our dream team that goes out. He is um, our videographer, but also he is uh, the third leg of our stool as we attempt to educate all areas of the black community. So we have kind of the youth here with Bria. We have uh, a little bit older with Jason and then a little bit older with myself. So uh, Jason, hello, introduce yourself. If you have a question, throw it out there. Um, uh, actually, Bill, um, a question I have is like for like fathers, um, cause there's good fathers, but we get kind of, um, um, shadowed out by all the bad fathers or whatnot. Um, is there any, um, good, um, programs that, um, can help fathers, um, fight for their children? I know there's equal rights for divorced fathers and there's some pro bonos, uh, situations out there, but, um, for some fathers trying to prove that they're children are in an unhealthy environment with their mothers and a more healthy environment with their fathers. Um, what direction or advice could you give fathers trying to get their children out of an unhealthy environment? Very good. That, that's an excellent, excellent question. And fortunately, the answers to that question are, are very positive and hopeful to fathers out there and, and to mothers out there. Um, the science that they have done back in the day, they thought that during it was called the tender year doctrine that during you know the time that the children were small that they would be better off being with primary custody with their mothers but over the years and the science and everything has proven that children generally do better if they have a significant relationship with both parents in their lives as of october 1st 2016 the legislature has put in it into effect a law that says whether you're married whether you're unmarried that you have joint legal joint physical custody of the of the children even before you go to court and when you go into court when the court makes the very first order the court has it's a preference under the statute that the court give joint legal joint physical custody uh, that is a great law it had been lobbied for for many years and what that means, all things being considered, assuming that, you know, one parent doesn't have a substance abuse or there's not domestic violence, but you have two good parents, the children should end up in a joint legal, joint physical custody under the law. Because again, the, the, the facts, the law shows that, that children, they end up being more well-rounded children and more well-rounded adults when they have both parents with a significant part in their lives. And so that's what the law is. And so when you go into court as a father, 
or as a mother, you should, you know, feel pretty comfortable that all things being equal, you should walk out of there with joint legal, joint physical custody. And that's how I would handle it, just following the law. But even before the law was, was created, you know, that's, that's what makes children better. And when you have an absentee parent, because the law says, hey, you know, you're only going to see your, your child part time, that's not fair to children. And it, that doesn't help them progress the way they should. Thanks, Bill. You're very welcome. I would like to add one other thing. Um, I had jobs like in high school, I bus tables. I had a job like in college for a while where I was loading trucks for UPS, you know, sweat labor for four hours a night. Um, I've had all, all sorts of different jobs that I think brings to the table as a judge experiences that a lot of the judges don't have. And for me, it's very important that you don't forget who you are. And as a judge, you're not better than anybody else on the planet, you know, and the janitors at the courthouse and people that work there, I knew them on a first name basis because they're important to me and anybody in the courtroom is going to, to feel important. And if you lose perspective as a judge that, you know, when you're making decision regarding somebody's children and or their divorce, those are the, some of the most important decisions that are gonna be made in their lives. What I try to do as a judge, and I do it, I do it very well, is I allow them to be in an atmosphere where they can make those decisions themselves and help them do it and help them get out of court. Okay. So let me ask you a question. Um, should you um, be elected? How would you, and I'm specifically talking to about the black community because disproportionately we seem to be in the courts disproportionately we seem to get the hardest, severest uh, decisions that come out. Disproportionately, you look at even when children are taken away, it seems like disproportionately African-American uh, kind of run that zero tolerance and their kids are taken away. What measures, what do you think changes should happen to actually reduce and uh, reduce the amount of parents that are losing their, their kids on technicalities. Because again, there seems to be like a zero tolerance when it comes to my community versus other communities. There seems to be a little wiggle room and actually more of an attempt to allow them to uh, keep the families together. And as I said, what do you see? How would you improve the present situation? And Give us from the aspect of the black community why we would consider to you to be one of the candidates of choice. Very good. So again, for the last four years, I've been in abuse and neglect court almost on a daily basis. I would say 40, 50 percent of my clients are African American, and I represent them going into court and making sure that when there, there's a removal, that there is a factual basis for that removal, that there's a legal basis for that removal and that they have done everything that they possibly could have done in order to leave those children in the home. And a lot of times it's putting another safe relative in that home to supervise and to monitor because the damage when you take children out of the home and you put them in the foster care system is very damaging and they love their parents and taking them and putting them with strangers is, is emotional stressful, not only for the parents, but for the children. And we have found if you keep those kids in the home and you're able to do it safely, obviously if you have, you know, let's say both parents are strung out on heroin um, or methamphetamine and there's real safety issues, but too many times those safety issues, that danger isn't such where you have to remove the children. I can only as an advocate in court argue for what needs to be done but as a judge, I can make the Department of Family Services foster care. I can make that. I can hold their feet to the fire and make sure that they do everything possible in the first place to keep the children in the home. But once you remove them, do everything that they can do. Take all the steps, give them the services, the treatment, the support to get those children back in the home as soon as possible. I have a greater ability to affect that, impact that on the other side of the bench than being an advocate, because as an advocate, my abilities are limited. As a judge, I can put, you know, 
I can put them in place if the Department of Family Services needs to be put in place because that's your role as a judge. And so within the African American community, they're going to see that and they're going to have a judge that's going to say, look, you haven't done enough. You cannot remove those children on those facts. You need to put them back in the home. Okay. Uh, Jason, Bria, any questions? Um, no, I believe you've answered great questions and I'm really happy that I got the chance to meet you and speak with you because I know for sure I already wrote your name down that I'm definitely voting for you. So you've got my vote. Well, I've thank you very much. Over 12,000 people on my social media, Instagram platform. And I just made a Facebook because I realized a lot of, you know, older people have Facebook, so I should probably have one too. Um, so I'm going to be definitely um, putting your name out there. Well, I, I tell you what, um, I, I have a couple millennials in my home who helped me out um, and I have a Facebook page as uh, Bill Gonzalez for judge um, and you can look at my Facebook page I would greatly appreciate it if you could go ahead and um, send me a friend request also um, like my page you'll see information on there I've gotten a lot of support in our community um, so you know right now social media and getting your message out to everybody is really important because that's the only way that you know you're going to get on the bench and most people won't know anything about your character your integrity so i appreciate that and uh you know they have my number if you have any fo uh, follow-up questions or anything i'm i'm here as a member of the community and i'm happy to help out awesome. okay. jason you have anything no he answered all my stuff thanks bill it's a pleasure talking to you oh yeah. likewise likewise so if if you all could send a, a friend request you know, for your pages and your uh, on Facebook and your domains and stuff, I will gladly uh, accept them and follow you. Awesome. Well, you can go on, uh, if you go on Facebook and type independent black voters, uh, uh -huh. and if you uh, basically, you'll get approved by me, and then you can talk and put your information out. Uh, again, we thank you for uh, spending the time to talk to us. In the next couple of weeks, it's going to be important that uh, we be informed voters and that we have a chance. We give people the opportunity to look at you and then make a decision. We will be doing some endorsements towards the end of the month, and we thank you for the opportunity. We'll probably contact you some more off of Zoom to talk to you some more in the very near future. Okay? Very good. You all have a blessed day day and enjoy your easter all right Bye. same to you thanks all right you take care